It's the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. Human Rights Watch reports regularly on the violations of human rights and international law in Israel and Palestine, a fact which the Israeli government uses as a part of its argument that Israel is a democracy which protects freedom of speech. Now, this argument was undermined when the Israeli authorities announced last month that the director of Human Rights Watch for Israel and Palestine, Omar Shakir, will be deported from the country. The reason given for the deportation is his alleged support for the BDS movement, the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement against Israel. In other words, he was accused of holding forbidden political views using a new amendment to a law applied against BDS supporters. An Israeli court then suspended the deportation last minute and uh, we will hear more about that uh, coming up soon but such a decision gives us a glimpse of how this new amendment to a law could be used. Last week, Human Rights Watch published a new report which uh, has the title Bankrolling Abuse Israeli Banks in the West Bank Settlements. It is on the role of Israeli banks in expanding legal colonization in the occupied Palestinian territories. So joining us to talk about all of this with me today is Omar Shakir. He is uh, he's in Israel Palestine for the time being. He is the director of Israel Palestine uh, at Human Rights Watch. Thanks for joining us, Omar. Thank you for having me. All right, Omar, let's start off with uh, how the authorities use this new law just legislated last year in order to deport you. Explain the law, how it was used, and how you are fighting it at the moment. Sure, absolutely. So in March of 2017, the Israeli government passed an amendment to its law of entry. Now, that amendment um, authorizes the interior ministry to deny entry to individuals who publicly support boycotts of Israel. Now, the law references a prior uh, 2011 law on boycotts, and it's quite actually vague in how it defines boycott, you know, bringing together both those that, you know, are full supporters of the BDS movement to those that call for companies to stop doing business, for example, in settlements because of concerns about human rights. So um, in the Israeli government now, it's part of a months-long campaign to silence Human Rights Watch. A year and a half ago, they denied a work permit um, for the organization to have any foreign employee in Israel. Then the allegation was that the organization is propaganda on behalf of Palestinians. We went public at the time, and ultimately the government reversed and ultimately granted us a work permit. And I received a work visa subject to that work permit in April of 2017. Now, uh, we received notice last month, um, as you mentioned, that the government has revoked Human Rights Watch's work permit in order for me to leave the country in 14 days, which they alleged was based on my support for boycotts. Now, interestingly, the Interior Ministry here is saying that I actually don't currently um, call for boycotts, and neither does Human Rights Watch as an organization. In fact, they justified their decision on an intelligence dossier the government produced regarding my activities, many of which go back years to when I was a college student. So basically what the government has done here is gone even beyond the draconian law and actually deporting somebody that has legal status in the country who they say isn't calling for boycotts currently based on views that they allege the person articulated years and years ago, which is a dangerous precedent not only for the thousands of um, human rights, uh, the, the many human rights defenders here, but the thousands of foreigners who happen to reside in Israel and in the occupied Palestinian territory. Right. Now, Omar, um, your specific case and the way in which you're feeling the crunch at Human Rights Watch and, and its staff um, is one thing. But you say that it is, uh, there are thousands of people that might be affected by such a law. Uh, do we know uh, at the moment how broadly it is being used and the pressure people are feeling from it as a result? 
Well, we know that there have been, you know, dozens of people that have been denied entry. I mean, going back many years, but even since the enactment of this amendment, just as recently as the end of April, there was a delegation from the Center for Constitutional Rights, you know, including a professor at Columbia University who chairs their board and a prominent civil rights lawyer who's the executive director who were denied entry. Um, so we know there have been many cases of internationals denied entry. Um, in many cases after questioning that relate to their political views and their views on boycott. Now, according to the government itself, this is the first time they deport somebody with legal status in the country based on their alleged views on boycott. In many cases, the government sees this as a test case. But of course, it's not an aberration. Um, as you mentioned in the introduction, I mean, this is part of a context in which there increasingly is a shrinking space for human rights defenders. That includes internationals. Um, that includes Israelis who have been accused of um, slander against the state or are calling um, against the army or against uh, officials. Um, then you have Palestinian rights defenders who have faced travel restrictions, criminal charges, and even arrests. Um, and then, of course, we're in year 51. We, uh, yesterday, we marked year 51 of the occupation, um, uh, which is characterized by systematic rights abuse and violations of international law. So while this case is the first use of this law to deport somebody in the country, it comes amid um, increasing efforts to deny entry to international rights defenders, restrictions on Palestinian and Israeli rights groups, and an occupation that is marked by serious abuse. Okay. All right. Uh, let me ask you a question about how human rights position itself, particularly in light of the ongoing conflict in, between Israel and Palestine and, and Gaza in particular. But many international organizations, such as the UN, for example, make a separation between Israel and the occupied Palestinian territory. But Human Rights Watch has one website and uh, and. Uh, um, approaches Israel-Palestine as more or less one nation. What is the reasoning for that uh, positioning, and how does that affect the work you're doing? Look, we take no position on uh, solutions or one state or two states. And in fact, my mandate, I cover all human rights abuses you know, within Israel proper, within the West Bank, within Gaza. So my mandate includes documenting abuses by Israel towards its own citizens inside its recognized borders, but also includes rights abuses by the Israeli occupying authority in Gaza and in the West Bank, as well as abuses by the Palestinian Authority and Hamas in the areas in which they um, have sovereignty. Um, it's regularly parts of part of our mandate that, you know, um, uh, particular positions cover more than one geographic entity. And that's simply a case here of the fact that I'm on the ground. It's easier for me to cover all areas. But it's not um, a characterization about how Human Rights Watch necessarily views the underlying situation, though we have made you know, the, the, the point, I think, quite strongly that in, in effect, between the Jordan River and in the Mediterranean, um, the authority that exercises the most control over the lives of all people is the Israeli government. Um, that includes, obviously, mo most clearly inside its borders. Um, then, of course, in Area C, where it has um, in the West Bank, the 60 percent of the West Bank in which it has both security and civil control. But frankly, it also applies to Area A and B, because although the Palestinian Authority nominally has civil control, the reality is the Israeli government still um, you know, is in charge of most acts aspects of everyday life, and also in the Gaza Strip, where although the Israeli government withdrew in 2005, it still maintains control of the airspace, the water space. It still maintains control over the entry and exit of people and goods. It controls the population registry. It bars the Palestinians from building an airport or a seaport. It controls even the custom and the VAT rates. It controls a no-go zone. So in reality, we, the UN, many others, consider Israel to still being an occupying power in Gaza. All right, Omar. Omar, we're going to take a pause here, uh, and we are going to get to the report you've just issued on bankrolling abuse. Uh, but uh, but let's end this segment and start up a second one. I thank you so much for joining us for now.